Chapter 11 of Introduction to Mathematical Philosophy by Bertrand Russell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Limits and Continuity of Functions. In this chapter, we shall be concerned with the definition of the limit of a function, if any, as the argument approaches a given value, and also with the definition of what is meant by a continuous function. Both of these ideas are somewhat technical, and would hardly demand treatment in a mere introduction to mathematical philosophy, but for the fact that, especially through the so-called infinitesimal calculus, wrong views upon our present topics have become so firmly embedded in the minds of professional philosophers that a prolonged and considerable effort is required for their uprooting. It has been thought ever since the time of Leibniz that the differential and integral calculus required infinitesimal quantities. Mathematicians, especially Weierstrass, proved that this is an error. But errors incorporated, for example, in what Hegel has to say about mathematics, die hard, and philosophers have tended to ignore the work of such men as Weierstrass. Limits in continuity of functions in works on ordinary mathematics are defined in terms involving number. This is not essential, as Dr. Whitehead has shown. Footnote 1, see Principia Mathematica, Volume 2, Star Numbers 230 to 234. End of footnote 1. We will, however, begin with the definitions in the textbooks, and proceed afterwards to show how these definitions can be generalized so as to apply to series in general, and not only to such as are numerical or numerically measurable. Let us consider any ordinary mathematical function f of x, where x and f of x are both real numbers, and f of x is one valued. That is, when x is given, there is only one value that f of x can have. We call x the argument, and f of x the value of the argument x. When a function is what we call continuous, the rough idea for which we are seeking a precise definition is that small differences in x shall correspond to small differences in f of x. And if we make the differences in x small enough, we can make the differences in f of x fall below any assigned amount. We do not want, if a function is to be continuous, that there shall be sudden jumps, so that for some value of x, any change, however small, will make a change in f of x which exceeds some assigned finite amount. The ordinary simple functions of mathematics have this property. It belongs, for example, to x squared, x cubed, and so on, to log of x, sine of x, and so on. But it is not at all difficult to define discontinuous functions. Take as a non-mathematical example the place of birth of the youngest person living at time t. This is a function of t. Its value is constant from the time of one person's birth to the time of the next birth. And then the value changes suddenly from one birthplace to the other. An analogous mathematical example would be the integer next below x, where x is a real number. This function remains constant from one integer to the next and then gives a sudden jump. The actual fact is that, though continuous functions are more familiar, they are the exceptions. There are infinitely more discontinuous functions than continuous ones. Many functions are discontinuous for one or several values of the variable, but continuous for all other values. Take as an example sine of 1 over x. The function sine theta passes through all values from negative 1 to 1 every time that theta passes from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, or from pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2, or generally from 2n minus 1 taken as the product with pi over 2, 2n plus 1 taken as the product with pi over 2, where n is any integer. Now if we consider 1 over x when x is very small, we see that as x diminishes, 1 over x grows faster and faster, 
so that it passes more and more quickly through the cycle of values from one multiple of pi over 2 to another as x becomes smaller and smaller. Consequently, sine of 1 over x passes more and more quickly from negative 1 to 1 and back again as x grows smaller. In fact, if we take any interval containing 0, say the interval from negative epsilon to positive epsilon, where epsilon is some very small number, sine of 1 over x will go through an infinite number of oscillations in this interval, and we cannot diminish the oscillations by making the interval smaller. Thus, round about the argument 0, the function is discontinuous. It is easy to manufacture functions which are discontinuous in several places, or in aleph sub zero places, or everywhere. Examples will be found in any book on the theory of functions of a real variable. Proceeding now to seek a precise definition of what is meant by saying that a function is continuous for a given argument, when argument and value are both real numbers, let us first define a neighborhood of a number x as all the numbers from x minus epsilon to x plus epsilon, where epsilon is some number which, in important cases, will be very small. It is clear that continuity at a given point has to do with what happens in any neighborhood of that point, however small. What we desire is this. If a is the argument for which we wish our function to be continuous, let us first define a neighborhood alpha say, containing the value f of a, which the function has for the argument a. We desire that if we take a sufficiently small neighborhood containing a, all values for arguments throughout this neighborhood shall be contained in the neighborhood of alpha, no matter how small we may have made alpha. That is to say, if we decree that our function is not to differ from f of a, by more than some very tiny amount, we can always find a stretch of real numbers, having a in the middle of it, such that throughout this stretch, f of x will not differ from f of alpha by more than the prescribed tiny amount. And this is to remain true whatever tiny amount we may select. Hence, we are led to the following definition. The function f of x is said to be continuous for the argument a if for every positive number sigma different from zero but as small as we please there exists a positive number epsilon different from zero such that for all values of delta which are numerically less footnote one a number is said to be numerically less than epsilon when it lies between negative epsilon and positive epsilon end of footnote one then epsilon the difference f of the sum of a and delta minus f of a is numerically less than sigma. In this definition, sigma first defines a neighborhood of f of a, namely the neighborhood from the difference of f of a from sigma to the sum of f of a and sigma. The definition proceeds to say that we can, by means of epsilon, define a neighborhood, namely that from the difference of a from epsilon to the sum of a and epsilon, such that, for all arguments within this neighborhood, the value of the function lies within the neighborhood from the difference of f of a from sigma to the sum of f of a and sigma. If this can be done, however sigma may be chosen, the function is continuous for the argument a. So far, we have not defined the limit of a function for a given argument. If we had done so, we could have defined the continuity of a function differently. A function is continuous at a point where its value is the same as the limit of its value for approaches either from above or from below. But it is only the exceptionally tame function that has a definite limit as the argument approaches a given point. The general rule is that a function oscillates, and that given any neighborhood of a given argument, however small, a whole stretch of values will occur for arguments within this neighborhood. As this is the general rule, let us consider it first. Let us consider what may happen as the argument approaches some value a from below. 
That is to say, we wish to consider what happens for arguments contained in the interval from the difference of a from e to a, where e is some number which, in important cases, will be very small. The values of the function for arguments from the difference of a from e to a, a excluded, will be a set of real numbers which will define a certain section of the set of real numbers, namely, the section consisting of those numbers that are not greater than all the values for arguments from the difference of a from e to a. Given any number in this section, there are values at least as great as this number for arguments between the difference of a from e and a, that is, for arguments that fall very little short of a, if e is very small. Let us take all possible epsilons and all possible corresponding sections. The common part of all these sections we will call the ultimate section, as the argument approaches a. To say that a number z belongs to the ultimate section is to say that, however small we may make epsilon, there are arguments between the difference of a from epsilon and a for which the value of the function is not less than z. We may apply exactly the same process to upper sections, that is, to sections that go from some point up to the top instead of the bottom up to some point. Here we take those numbers that are not less than all those values for arguments from the difference of a from epsilon to a. This defines an upper section which will vary as epsilon varies. Taking the common part of all such sections for all possible epsilons, we obtain the ultimate upper section. To say that a number z belongs to the ultimate upper section is to say that, however small we make epsilon, there are arguments between the difference of a from epsilon and a for which the value of the function is not greater than z. If a term belongs both to the ultimate section and to the ultimate upper section, we shall say that it belongs to the ultimate oscillation. We may illustrate the matter by considering once more the function sine of 1 over x as x approaches the value 0. We shall assume, in order to fit in with the above definitions, that this value is approached from below. Let us begin with the ultimate section between negative epsilon and zero, whatever epsilon may be, the function will assume the value 1 for certain arguments, but will never assume any greater value. Hence, the ultimate section consists of all real numbers, positive and negative, up to and including 1. That is, it consists of all negative numbers together with 0, together with the positive numbers up to and including 1. Similarly, the ultimate upper section consists of all positive numbers together with 0, together with the negative numbers down to and including negative 1. Thus, the ultimate oscillation consists of all real numbers from negative 1 to 1, both included. We may say generally that the ultimate oscillation of a function as the argument approaches a from below consists of all those numbers x which are such that, however near we come to a, we shall still find values as great as x and values as small as x. The ultimate oscillation may contain no terms or one term or many terms. In the first two cases, the function has a definite limit for approaches from below. If the ultimate oscillation has one term, this is fairly obvious. It is equally true if it has none, for it is not difficult to prove that, if the ultimate oscillation is null, the boundary of the ultimate section is the same as that of the ultimate upper section, and may be defined as the limit of the function for approaches from below. But if the ultimate oscillation has many terms, there is no definite limit to the function for approaches from below. In this case, we can take the lower and upper boundaries of the ultimate oscillation 
that is, the lower boundary of the ultimate upper section and the upper boundary of the ultimate section, as the lower and upper limits of its ultimate values for approaches from below. Similarly, we obtain lower and upper limits of the ultimate values for approaches from above. Thus we have, in the general case, four limits to a function for approaches to a given argument. The limit for a given argument A only exists when all these four are equal, and is then their common value. If it is also the value for the argument A, the function is continuous for this argument. This may be taken as defining continuity. It is equivalent to our former definition. We can define the limit of a function for a given argument if it exists without passing through the ultimate oscillation and the four limits of the general case. The definition proceeds, in that case, just as the earlier definition of continuity proceeded. Let us define the limit for approaches from below. If there is to be a definite limit for approaches to A from below, it is necessary and sufficient that, given any small number sigma, two values for arguments sufficiently near to A, but both less than A, will differ by less than sigma. That is, if epsilon is sufficiently small, and our arguments both lie between the difference of A from epsilon and A, A excluded, then the difference between the values for these arguments will be less than sigma. This is to hold for any sigma, however small. In that case, the function has a limit for approaches from below. Similarly, we define the case when there is a limit for approaches from above. These two limits, even when both exist, need not be identical. And if they are identical, they still need not be identical with the value for the argument a. It is only in this last case that we call the function continuous for the argument a. A function is called continuous without qualification when it is continuous for every argument. Another slightly different method of reaching the definition of continuity is the following. Let us say that a function ultimately converges into a class alpha if there is some real number such that, for this argument and all arguments greater than this, the value of the function is a member of the class alpha. Similarly, we shall say that a function converges into alpha as the argument approaches x from below if there is some argument y less than x such that throughout the interval from y included to x excluded, the function has values which are members of alpha. We may now say that a function is continuous for the argument a for which it has the value f of a if it satisfies four conditions, namely 1. Given any real number less than f of a, the function converges into the successors of this number as the argument approaches a from below. 2. Given any real number greater than f of a, the function converges into the predecessors of this number as the argument approaches a from below. 3 and 4. Similar conditions for approaches to a from above. The advantages of this form of definition is that it analyzes the conditions of continuity into four, derived from considering arguments and values respectively greater or less than the argument and value for which continuity is to be defined. We may now generalize our definitions so as to apply to series which are not numerical or known to be numerically measurable. The case of motion is a convenient one to bear in mind. There is a story by H. G. Wells which will illustrate, from the case of motion, the difference between the limit of a function for a given argument and its value for the same argument. The hero of the story, who possessed without his knowledge the power of realizing his wishes, was being attacked by a policeman. But on ejaculating, go to, he found that the policeman disappeared. If f of t was the policeman's position at time t, 
and t sub 0 the moment of the ejaculation, the limit of the policeman's positions as t approached to t sub 0 from below would be in contact with the hero, whereas the value for the argument t sub 0 was undefined. But such occurrences are supposed to be rare in the real world, and it is assumed, though without adequate evidence, that all motions are continuous. That is, that given any body, if f of t is its position at time t, f of t is a continuous function of t. It is the meaning of continuity involved in such statements which we now wish to define as simply as possible. The definitions given for the case of functions where the argument and value are real numbers can readily be adapted for more general use. Let P and Q be two relations, which it is well to imagine serial, though it is not necessary to our definitions that they should be so. Let R be a one-many relation whose domain is contained in the field of P, while its converse domain is contained in the field of Q. Then R is, in a generalized sense, a function, whose arguments belong to the field of Q, while its values belong to the field of P. Suppose, for example, that we are dealing with a particle moving on a line. Let Q be the time series, P the series of points on our line from left to right. R the relation of the position of our particle on the line at time A to the time A, so that the R of A is its position at time A. This illustration may be borne in mind throughout our definitions. We shall say that the function r is continuous for the argument a if, given any interval α on the p-series containing the value of the function for the argument a, there is an interval on the q-series containing a not as an endpoint, and such that, throughout this interval, the function has values which are members of α. We mean by an interval all the terms between any two, that is, if x and y are two members of the field of P, and x has the relation P to y, we shall mean by the P interval x to y all terms z, such that x has the relation P to z, and z has the relation P to y, together when so stated with x or y themselves. We can easily define the ultimate section and the ultimate oscillation. To define the ultimate section for approaches to the argument a from below, take any argument y which precedes a, that is, has the relation q to a. Take the values of the function for all arguments up to and including y, and form the section of p defined by these values, that is, those members of the p-series which are earlier than or identical with some of these values. Form all such sections for all y's that precede a, and take their common part. This will be the ultimate section. The ultimate upper section and the ultimate oscillation are then defined exactly as in the previous case. The adaptation of the definition of convergence and the resulting alternative definition of continuity offers no difficulty of any kind. We say that a function r is ultimately q-convergent into α if there is a member y of the converse domain of r in the field of q such that the value of the function for the argument y and for any argument to which y has the relation q is a member of α. We say that r q-converges into α as the argument approaches a given argument a if there is a term y having the relation q to a and belonging to the converse domain of r and such that the value of the function for any argument in the q interval from y inclusive to a exclusive belongs to alpha of the four conditions that a function must fulfill in order to be continuous for the argument a the first is putting b for the value for the argument a, given any term having the relation p to b, r q converges into the successors of b with respect to p 
as the argument approaches a from below. The second condition is obtained by replacing p by its converse. The third and fourth are obtained from the first and second by replacing q by its converse. There is thus nothing in the notions of the limit of a function or the continuity of a function that essentially involves number. Both can be defined generally, and many propositions about them can be proved for any two series, one being the argument series and the other the value series. It will be seen that the definitions do not involve infinitesimals. They involve infinite classes of intervals, growing smaller without any limit short of zero. But they do not involve any intervals that are not finite. This is analogous to the fact that if a line an inch long be halved, then halved again, and so on indefinitely, we never reach infinitesimals in this way. After n bisections, the length of our bit is 1 over 2 to the nth power of an inch. And this is finite, whatever finite number n may be. The process of successive bisection does not lead to divisions whose ordinal number is infinite, since it is essentially a one-by-one -one process. Thus, infinitesimals are not to be reached in this way. Confusions on such topics have had much to do with the difficulties which have been found in the discussion of infinity and continuity. End of chapter 11